We'd been walking for two days and my legs felt numb, like blocks of wood. My knees wobbled and shook. My feet were blistered and aching and there was no end in sight to the miles of abandoned wasteland all around us. Collapsed barns and farmhouses left in disrepair, shutters hanging off their hinges, banging in the wind. But at least there weren't many zombies. That was a nice change of pace. Why'd the damn helicopter have to go down out here in the middle of nowhere? Ray was asking, after shaking the last few drops of water from the canteen. Couldn't have crashed on a nice beach somewhere, you know? We could just sit back, drink rum from coconuts, and chill, waiting to be rescued. Man, ain't no coconuts around here, that's for sure. And definitely no rum. We need water, though, and soon. It'll be dark out in an hour or two. Let's hit this next farm and see what we can find. We went up the next long gravel driveway, heading towards a two-story farmhouse surrounded by overgrown fields. The surrounding plant life had taken over parts of the house. It was being reclaimed by overgrown brush, creeping vines, and a giant, sagging willow tree which stood out back, concealing its features like a funeral veil. Let's check inside. Maybe the taps still work. The houses around here were too far from the city to be on a municipal water supply. They all had indoor plumbing hooked straight into the wells which fed off the groundwater. These systems used pumps which relied on electricity to function, but most had a 10 to 50 gallon reservoir. As long as it hadn't been completely depleted, it would still be usable. Hopefully this house would give us what we needed and maybe a few other supplies too. Front or back? I asked. I picked last time. Let's go in the back. I always was an ass man. You're an ass, that's what you are. But okay, you got it, ass man. Back door it is. The gravel driveway crunched beneath our feet as we crept around to the rear of the old farmhouse. It was quiet inside, at least. That was a good sign. Ghouls tended to perk up at the sounds of nearby movement. And despite our best efforts, it was impossible to stay completely silent while moving, especially for me, a six and a half foot tall man. I tripped over a garbage can as we rounded the corner at the back of the house, as if to emphasize this point. The ruckus it stirred up was painfully loud in the dead silence of the rural landscape. I noticed that no birds were chirping. There were no squirrels or mice to be seen anywhere. This place had been abandoned by the world. I think we're okay, I said, regaining my balance and looking around nervously. If there were any ghouls around here, we'd have seen them by now. Just watch your step, Ray said. If there were any of them within a mile, they're headed this way now. I looked at my feet and apologized. I'd always been clumsy. If it got me killed, I could live with that, but I couldn't bear the thought of someone else dying because of my idiocy. We broke down the back door of the house, kicking it in and destroying the lock in the process. The old wooden door was splintered down the side and wouldn't stay closed. So we pushed a piece of heavy furniture in front of it to provide some security. The wardrobe was large and strong and looked capable of preventing a handful of zombies from entering. Next, we set about clearing the farmhouse. The last thing you want is to get surprised by lurking household zombies when you pick a place to crash for the night. It's best to deal with these things right away. A stitch in time saves nine, as they say. And stitches don't do shit for zombie bites anyways. Actually, by this point in the zombie apocalypse, the most terrifying prospect was no longer the idea of stumbling across a zombie in one of these closed rooms, but finding a living person. We knew what zombies would do, and to a certain extent, they were predictable. They see you, they try to eat you. We cut off their heads and repeat over and over and over again. People are far less predictable. Where a zombie will make noise at your approach, clumsy and stupid, a person will wait quietly in the shadows. They may act as a friend, claiming to be hurt or innocent, just searching for a party to join. And we do look for those types of survivors, but they might also be pretending, waiting for you to turn your back before cutting your throat right after shaking your hand and becoming your ally. We'd seen it all before, so we weren't as trusting these days. The house was dark, all of the curtains were drawn. 
we pulled out our flashlights and began to move from the back door in the kitchen towards the front of the house to what appeared to be the living room. Wooden floorboards creaked beneath our boots as we stepped carefully into the next room. There was no indication of recent life here, and I guessed that the owners had been gone for quite some time. The front foyer was similarly empty, as was the bathroom and a small sewing room and office on the main level. Despite the quiet ambiance and the appearance of abandonment, the house had an eerie feeling I didn't like much. It was like we weren't entirely alone there, but the source of that sensation was one I couldn't place. Still, I knew better than to ignore that feeling. My spidey sense is tingling, I said to Ray. Stay frosty. it, he muttered. All right, thanks for the heads up. He knew I had a sixth sense for these things. We crept up the stairs to the second floor, keeping our voices low and our weapons ready. I carried a razor-sharp machete, while Ray had a small hand axe and wore a katana, a Japanese antique he'd found in a pawn shop. He had it strapped to his back for as long as I could remember. Anything? He asked. I don't hear a peep. Could be a sleeper though. Okay, rat side first. He kicked in the door to the right at the top of the stairs. Dark and empty. A boy's room. There were three others. A master bedroom, a bathroom, and one more smaller bedroom, which looked like it had once belonged to a young girl. The walls were painted powder pink, and there were posters and drawings of horses, rainbows, castles, and fairy princesses. All of these rooms were empty. An eerie sound came from outside as the wind chime on the front porch was blown in the breeze. I shuddered thinking of what else might have caused its sudden movement. Basement? Gotta check, who knows, maybe I'm losing it. Maybe we're in the clear and I'm just getting paranoid. Ray's face told me he wished this were true, but previous experience suggested otherwise. The two of us went back down to the main level and stood in front of the door leading to the basement. I put my ear to the wood and waited, listening. It was quiet and still as far as I could tell, but something told me we weren't alone in this place. I felt as if I was being watched. I held up my left hand and counted down on my fingers. Three, two, one, go, I whispered. Pushing open the door, I cast the beam of my flashlight down into the darkness. Dust motes hovered and danced in the air before us. Taking a hesitant step, I began to descend. The stairs groaned and creaked loudly beneath my feet, and I winced with each step as the old wood bent with my weight. Once at the bottom, I cast the flashlight beam around to survey the cement-floored basement. It was cluttered with junk, electronics, toys, and stacked boxes. There were cases of empty beer bottles and heaped piles of moldy clothing. A rat scurried past our feet, ducking beneath the stairs and disappearing into a gap that looked far too narrow for its girth. Ugh, I hate rats, Ray muttered. It stinks down here. Let's check this dump out quickly and get back upstairs. Quick but careful, okay? I still got the feeling. Would you relax? It's empty. Nobody pitches a perfect game every time, dude. It's all right if you're wrong every once in a while. Ray was meandering into the darker section of the basement with his hands held outwards like a showman when he stopped speaking abruptly. What? A dark shape suddenly appeared from nowhere. It pounced, appearing from the shadows like a jaguar that had been lying in wait for its meal. Ray's screams rose higher and higher as he thrashed and pushed at the scrawny girl attacking him. He stuck his hands out defensively and two of his fingers were quickly bitten off. Then, while he was distracted, the kid jumped up on his back and began to choke him with her legs in a triangle hold while tearing at his face with her nails. Eventually, he toppled to the floor, his face turning blue from lack of air. Despite the size difference, the feral nature of the teenage girl was too much for him to handle. She was like a cornered rat, biting and scratching at him viciously. I shone my flashlight, moving towards him from the other end of the basement, but all I could see at first was a blur of movement and blood being sprayed and splashed in the air. As I got closer, I saw what looked to be a girl in her mid-teens, moving animalistically and dressed in tattered pink rags that might have once been pajamas. Her hair was black and greasy, covering her features as she tore at my friend's throat with her teeth, swallowing down pieces of flesh and making wet, sloppy sounds as she chewed. 
Ray's cries for help turned to gurgling croaks and crackling wheezes as he began to choke on his own blood. A dark puddle spread across the floor, pooling around my feet as I slowly approached and drew closer. As I held up my machete with a trembling hand, I prepared to swing it at the young girl's head. She may not have been a zombie, but she sure did act like one. Hunger changes people. I'd seen it before, and more than once. It makes them desperate, turns them into animals of instinct and need. Dead rat carcasses littered the floor, many of them half eaten with the remaining flesh mummified. Others were just the heads and tails with skeletal remains attached in between, like a drumstick picked clean. What's your name, little girl? I asked, my voice trembling, lowering my weapon and hoping she had some morsel of humanity left inside of her. Her eyes glanced up from my friend's bloody, gasping body, then back down again a moment later. She ripped another strip of flesh from his midsection with her sharp, blackened nails, and he convulsed in agony. Her fingernails were several inches long, resembling talons. My name's Henry. It looks like you've been down here by yourself for a long time. Where did your parents go? Again, she looked up at me for a split second before staring down at the body beneath her. Her face twitched and she paused what she was doing for a second, but then went back to consuming the bloody pieces of skin. Ray gurgled once more and his eyes rolled back. I couldn't tell if he was breathing anymore, but it didn't look like he was. Listen, I know this isn't you. I can get you some help. What's your name? She swallowed the piece of skin that was in her mouth and spoke softly, saying, Tabitha. Well, Tabitha, that's my friend Ray you're eating. Now I know you're hungry, but we don't eat people, okay? She growled like a dog whose bone was being taken away. Ah, uh-uh, none of that. Now if you can behave yourself, you can come back to the Ighor, home base with me, and we can get you some real food. But you can't be doing this sort of thing, okay? No more eating people. We're not zombies. We're better than that. Ighor? Really? You're a part of Ighor? She thought about it another moment before nodding reluctantly, and I stuck out my hand for her to take. After a moment's hesitation, she stood up on shaking legs and walked over to me. She took my hand, and I thought maybe she'd let me lead her away from that place, up the stairs, and away from that bloody basement. But instead, she immediately took a huge bite from my arm as if it were a turkey leg, her jaw snapping down on my wrist with surprising force. I went to my knees as the pain racked through me. Frozen, I watched in terror as another figure in ragged scraps of clothing emerged from the shadows, just a silhouette visible at first. A teenage boy, her brother, I guessed. He was moving on all fours like a dog, sniffing at the air. Oh, Bobby. She called out into the darkness. It's your turn. Dinner time. I directed my big brown box truck up the driveway, branches scraping along the top and sides as I went. It was two days after day, so I was out late delivering packages well after dark, and the house at the end of the driveway was my least favorite stop. Pretty much every single time I delivered to them, which was several times a week usually, I heard screaming and shouting coming from the old mansion. The place was tucked back on a wooded property a good half mile from the road. I could tell that it had been a nice place at one time, but it certainly wasn't anymore. The entire front yard was choked with old cars in various states of disrepair, along with decrepit washing machines, dead dryers, broken plumbing fixtures, and a thousand other pieces of garbage that had been tossed there. Walking up the cluttered stone steps to the door was always an exercise in agility. I tried my best not to trip and break my neck, especially at night. As I rounded the final bend in the driveway, headlights sweeping over the maze of junk in the yard, I thought I saw movement behind a couple of discarded appliances, just a quick blur like a large animal fleeing or someone ducking down to hide. I didn't think much of it, having seen deer and raccoons among the debris many times, apparently drawn there by food scraps. There was just enough room at the end of the driveway for me to turn around. We were always supposed to turn around before delivering at a stop instead of after, 
so that's what I did. Once I had the truck positioned facing out, I shut off the engine and opened up the door to the cargo area. I only had about 20 stops to go, so finding the package wasn't hard. As I shut the door and stepped out of the vehicle, I realized there was no screaming coming from the house. Even at almost 10 o'clock at night, this was a rarity. I'd been delivering to the two men who lived in the house for the better part of a year. They both had the same last name and looked very similar, so I figured they were brothers. One was Timothy and the other was Martin. Heading up the stairs to the front door, I kept my eyes on my feet so I wouldn't trip on anything. At the top of the stairs, I set the box down and pulled out my scanner. As I scanned the barcode, I noticed that the front door was open a crack. Something moved out in the yard, thumping against a metal appliance. I spun around, looking out at the dark shapes on both sides of the driveway. With my truck's headlights off, I couldn't see much of anything. Shaking my head, I pressed a couple of buttons on my scanner to complete the delivery, then started the treacherous journey down the stairs. There were soda bottles, action figures, loose nails, and even marbles on the stairs, like they wanted people to trip and fall. I made it to the bottom safely and moved up the driver's side of the truck, jumping into the seat before I saw the person sitting in the jump seat on the other side. Launching myself out of the truck, I turned around and looked inside, my pulse thrumming. It was one of the brothers, Martin. He hadn't moved at all, but he looked wrong. He was kind of bloody around the ears and the forehead, but he didn't seem to be actively bleeding. It was almost as if he had superficial cuts along his hairline. It was so dark, I couldn't see clearly. Martin, I said, you okay? He didn't answer, his eyes were closed. Looking around the yard, I felt like I was being watched. Moving around the truck, I came to the passenger side. The door stayed open while I was delivering, so I was able to go right up to him. I stuck my hand out and touched his shoulder. He slumped down, falling off the seat and into the footwell. Acting on reflex, I reached forward and caught him before he fell all the way out of the truck. He was still warm, so I didn't think he was dead. I got him out of the truck and laid him on the driveway before kneeling next to him and pulling out my phone. I reached under his chin to feel for a pulse, and that's when the skin on his face shifted with a wet, sucking sound. I pulled my hand away just as the man sat up like he was yanked on a string. He reached up and grabbed his face, pulling it off completely. With a jolt of terror, I realized it was the other brother, Timothy. He'd been wearing Martin's face. As he pulled the skin off his own face, he revealed wild eyes and a sickly grin. He cocked his head sideways as he looked at me, then belted out shrieking laughter. I bolted away from him, straight into the yard. I ran down the side of the driveway, dodging around all the junk. But when I came to the place where I thought I'd seen movement earlier, I tripped over something. My phone flew out of my hands as I hit the ground. Looking back, I saw that I had tripped over Martin. Not only was the skin of his face gone, but the skin of his entire upper body was in the process of being removed. My stomach revolted and I puked even as I was getting up to run again. After making it a few feet, I came to my senses, ducking down behind the shell of an old Camaro. I looked and listened, but there was no sign of the crazed man. I peered at my truck, knowing it was my best bet for getting to safety. If I could just get to it, I could start it up in a matter of seconds and be on my way. It was better than running the half mile to the road. I'd been working for nearly 10 hours and my legs were heavy with fatigue. I couldn't make it to the road without the truck, but I could put everything I had into a mad dash to the vehicle. Taking a deep breath, I bolted from my hiding place, running straight down the driveway feeling like an Olympic sprinter. I heard Timothy's shrieking laughter nearby as I threw myself into the truck. Four seconds later, I jammed down on the gas pedal and lurched down the road. Up ahead, Timothy darted out onto the driveway, knife in hand. He laughed, probably thinking I would stop. At the last moment, he dove to the left, but I was ready for it. I jerked the wheel that way, smashing him against the very same Camaro I hid behind. As the truck continued on, he was dragged along between the two vehicles before he fell. My back left tire bumped over him as I pulled the truck back onto the driveway. 
When I got to the road, I turned and went down to the nearest house. I'd lost my phone when I tripped over Martin, so I had to wake someone to have them call the police. As I got out of the truck, I walked down the side, seeing the damage I'd done. There were dents and scrapes all along the side of the vehicle, but no blood. As I moved down past the rear wheel, a hand shot out from under the truck and grabbed my ankle. I tried to run away, but he wouldn't let go. I tripped and fell. The last thing I saw was his insane grin and the glint of his knife in the moonlight. I'm turning off the lights in the house when I hear the noise. It's a giggle and it's coming from Layla's room. At first, I'm ready to just let it go. But then I think about the last time I heard her giggling. I had ducked my head inside the room with a smile on my face to look at my niece, hoping she was finally coming out of her shell. But what I saw made me think just the opposite. She was sitting on her bed, her back to me, and hugging her doll tightly. The doll's appearance made me step back from the door. I still hadn't gotten used to it. Its eyes were completely white, its face cracked and distorted at the mouth, giving it a lopsided grin. And as I stepped into the room, I noticed that Layla wasn't just hugging the doll. She was squeezing it with all her might, her little body shaking as if she were trying to suffocate the thing. When she saw I was in the room, she stopped, putting the doll down and looking mutely up at me. I asked if she was okay, but she didn't answer. She hadn't spoken a word to me since her parents, my sister and brother-in-law, were killed in a car accident. But even before that, my sister had told me she thought something was wrong with Layla. Poor girl, she's at it hard, and she's my responsibility now. As I move up the stairs after turning off the lights, I'm not sure if I should peek into the room or not. Maybe the doll is some sort of coping mechanism. Maybe I should let it run its course. I tell myself if the creepy doll is getting her to giggle, it's a good thing, but I'm not so sure. It's been only a week since the accident, an accident Layla was there for. It's a miracle she survived, given that both her parents died in the car crash. The child psychologist I contacted told me it takes time. We have an appointment to see her tomorrow. So I stop outside her door, which is cracked open a couple of inches, and peer inside. I can see Layla sitting on the side of the bed, her back to me. She's looking across to the other side of the room. I can't see what she's looking at, but Layla seems to be having a good time. She's kicking her little legs and making humming sounds. There's a noise like a book falling to the ground from inside the room. My heart goes double time because I've been watching Layla the whole time. She hasn't moved. Suddenly, I'm certain someone's in the room with her. I shove the door open to reveal the strange doll staring at me with its blank white eyes. It's sitting on the little rocking chair next to the window. There's a picture book on the floor in front of the rocking chair. Layla moves her head slowly, turning to look at me. Her eyes are slitted, her lips pressed together. Stepping into the room, I look around for signs of anyone else. Is someone in here with you? Layla crosses her chubby little arms and looks away, blonde hair whipping over her shoulder. I fix my gaze on the doll. It still seems to be looking at me, like its head is turned to follow me as I move around the room. But that can't be possible. A sudden rush of anger crashes against the inside of my skull. Rushing forward, I reach out to grab the damn doll, to throw it into a corner so it's not looking at me anymore. But before I can touch it, Layla releases a high-pitched scream from the bed. As soon as I turn to look at her, she stops, staring up at me. What? I say. What's wrong? There's a thump, and I look over to see the doll on the floor next to the picture book. As I reach down to pick both items up, Layla screams again. <coughs> Clenching my teeth, I grab the book and the doll and... A blast of frigid air runs up my arm from the doll. My spine crackles as I wrench my head back, eyes rolling up into my skull as the world around me rushes away in a whoosh of schizophrenic colors. I find myself in the back of a car, a familiar car, my sister Jenny sedan. My brother-in-law Mike is driving and my sister, sits in the front passenger seat, looking down at her phone. Layla sits in a toddler car seat in the back. The doll is in her lap, looking like a normal toy without the white eyes or the creepy grin. 
I'm here, but not here. I have no form. I'm not sitting. Instead, I seem to be floating above the scene as the car drives along a two-lane highway. Layla looks at her doll, then up at her father, and then out the windshield. The road ahead seems clear. There are several driveways leading to homes on either side of the small highway, but no cars for the time being. Then I see a truck up ahead, backing out of one of the driveways on the right side of the road. Daddy? Layla says. Yes? Mike says, looking up into the rearview mirror. Look! She says, holding up the doll and making it dance. Mike's eyes start to go back to the road, but Layla screams. Look! The truck in the driveway isn't slowing. I want to scream, to tell Mike to stop or to pay attention. Layla throws the doll at the side of her father's head. He wrenches his head away, jerking the wheel slightly, but not nearly enough to get out of the lane. Up ahead, the truck's back tires bump onto the highway. Jenny looks up from her phone and screams, but it's too late. The sedan hits it going 60 miles an hour. Glass flies as the sedan skids sideways and flips, rolling twice before coming to rest upside down in a ditch on the other side of the road. Jenny is clearly dead, the side of her skull bashed in, but Mike is still alive. He gasps, <gasps> hanging upside down in his seat. Layla, who seems unfazed and untouched, releases herself from the car seat and grabs a piece of broken glass. She crouches behind her father and uses the glass to open up his carotid artery. Blood pours out onto the doll, which came to rest below him on the overturned roof of the car. Layla quickly grabs the blood-covered doll and moves out of the car. As the vision fades, I can hear Mike and Jenny screaming, pleading for my help. I realize with sickening clarity that they're stuck in the doll, stuck there until the terrible wrong inflicted upon them is made right. My legs give and I sit down hard in Layla's room, letting go of the doll. Chest heaving, I look up at the bed, but Layla's gone. I turn my head, seeing her step into the doorway from the hall, a terrible grin on her little face. She has a knife in her hand, and I know she plans to use it. The rain came down in curtains, turning the city streets into rivers and the towering buildings into canyon walls. Lightning flashed occasionally through the darkness, reflecting off windows and briefly illuminating the cityscape in sickly hues. The thunderclaps that followed shook the ground under my feet as I trudged back to my unmarked squad car. As I walked, my baseball cap keeping the rain out of my eyes, I paid close attention to the storm drains. They were struggling to funnel all the rain down off the streets, given the immensity of the downpour. I don't know what drew my attention to the alley as I passed. Maybe it was the flash of lightning at the perfect moment. Maybe it was a flash of movement I saw out of the corner of my eye. Whatever it was, I found myself peering at a huge figure cloaked in black. He was hunched over, a petite woman held in his hands, her feet a full foot off the ground. She was limp, head lolling. It was as if she weighed nothing at all. The man wore a hood, and his eyes seemed to glow as they stared at me from that dark oval, the rest of his face obscured by rain and darkness. I froze in mid-step as the gears groaned in my overworked mind. Don't move, I shouted. The man dropped the woman and bolted away from me down the alley. I was running before the woman's body came to rest on the soaking alley floor. As I ran after him, I pulled my pistol out from my hip holster, shouting again for him to stop. Police, I yelled as he turned the corner on the next block. He moved with a natural fluidity that reminded me of a talented athlete but I was a runner too. I had the medals from college to show for it. He led me into a part of the city populated by warehouses and old tenements. I kept up with him, not gaining and not falling behind. I watched him turn into an abandoned tenement. By the time I made it through the boarded up door, I saw an interior doorway just ahead, falling closed on its own. Bolting through that door and then down a set of stairs, I soon found myself in a basement, surrounded by impenetrable darkness. Stopping at the bottom of the stairwell, I reached into the pocket of my raincoat and found my flashlight. The only sound other than rainwater dripping off my clothes was my heavy breathing. 
I clicked on my flashlight and shone it around. The light revealed brick walls and scraps of trash here and there. Next to an archway on the opposite side of the room, there was a piece of an old wooden headboard propped against the wall. I turned my attention to the archway. As I shone the light through, the dark, hulking figure rushed past, caught in my light for the briefest of moments. Come out here now with your hands up, I called. The basement reeked of death. I knew without a doubt that this was the man I'd been looking for. He was the reason I'd been out in the rain at such a late hour. He'd been killing people all across the city, leaving them drained of blood. A few of my co-workers joked that I was looking for a vampire. I knew better. I had no doubt that this person wanted to be a vampire. Maybe he even drank the blood when he got it out of them. But I was sure he wasn't sticking fangs into their necks to drink their blood. I didn't know how he was getting it out of his victims, but I would find out soon enough. The idiot had cornered himself in a basement, and the rotting smell told me he likely had some victims' bodies down here. Edging toward the doorway, I called out again. Give it up! I'm not in the mood for this shit. Not tonight, asshole! As I got closer, I could see that the room beyond the archway was slightly wider than the one I was in. When I was six feet away from the entrance, the figure stepped into my flashlight beam, back near the far wall. His head was down, the hood obscuring his face. Good, I said. Now put your hands. Another dark figure stepped into the light, and then another, and another. There were four of them, and they were all identically dressed, all wearing large black cloaks. The words stuck in my throat. I realized I hadn't used my rover to call for backup. Stupid. As I was regaining my ability to speak, all four figures snapped their heads up in unison, revealing gruesomely elongated and pale faces with faintly glowing red eyes. They smiled at me, fangs unmistakable even from this distance. They rushed forward all at once. I hesitated only a moment before firing at them, shooting them each in the chest twice, just like I'd been taught. They went down in a ragged line, stretched out from the back wall to the archway. I breathed heavily, the loud reports of the gunfire echoing in my ears. The first one I'd shot stirred, pushing himself off the dirty floor. I gaped, watching idiotically as the second one did the same. And then the third. I had no time for disbelief, no room for doubt. Looking down at my gun, I thought about running. Then I remembered the piece of broken headboard next to the archway. I raised the gun and fired twice more at each of the creatures, hoping it would slow them down as much as the first shots had. I only had one round left in the gun, so I ejected the magazine and exchanged it with my spare. Moving toward the piece of furniture, I holstered my gun and stuck my flashlight between my teeth. I grabbed the piece of wood, snapping it in half on my knee. I now had a wooden stake in each hand. I stepped back to the archway, shining my light at the floor. The creatures were gone. In their place were only small splotches of blood. Something moved over my head and I looked up, illuminating one of the gruesome faces just as the creature dropped on me from the ceiling. I let myself fall, sticking one of the stakes up. As we hit the ground, the creature impaled himself on it, red eyes wide. He screeched before exploding into smoldering ash. Another creature was on me immediately too, wide mouth open fangs glinting as it went for my neck. I dropped the stake in my left hand and used the appendage to stop the creature. My pinky and ring fingers accidentally slipped into his mouth and he bit down on them, severing them like they were nothing more than carrots. I had no time to consider what had happened. I jammed the other stake into his chest and he burst into ash. A third vampire grabbed me by the collar and threw me into the wall. I smashed into the brick structure face first the flashlight in my mouth breaking a couple of teeth out before falling to the floor, but I managed to hold onto the stake. The remaining two vampires rushed me, one after the other. Although the flashlight had broken a couple of my teeth, it was still working fine. The device provided enough illumination for me to see the attack coming. I lunged up from the ground and jammed the stake through the first one's chest, then changed direction and hit the lone remaining creature with the tip of the stake that was sticking out of his comrade's back. They both burst into glowing ash. Knowing time was of the essence, 
I quickly grabbed the flashlight back up and swept it along the ground, hoping to see two things that belonged to me. Sure enough, there they were, around the area where I had killed the second vampire, my pinky and ring fingers. They hadn't turned to ash, despite being inside the vampire's body when I'd killed them. I swiped the fingers up with my good hand while holding the flashlight with the remaining fingers of my other. Upon stepping outside, I found that the rain had let up. I managed a crooked and bloody smile as I headed for the nearest hospital, my two fingers gripped gently in my hand. It takes a special kind of person to become an exterminator. I was reminded of this again as I stared into the pitch black basement tunnel. Dusty cobwebs hung down from the ceiling. The darkness was so thick I could taste it. Or maybe that was the asbestos. Typically the asylum maintenance people took care of pest control for the old mental hospital on their own. It was unusual for them to call in outside help. The problem must have been beyond their abilities, I thought to myself. They've been coming from down that way. The big ones are almost the size of cats. I've never seen anything like it. The young, pimple-faced security guard was just exaggerating, I thought. I'm gonna need you to come down there with me. I don't have a key for the doors. Nuh-uh. I'm not going in there. Not with all those rats running around. You don't have a choice. I need to get inside. You're the security guard. You want me to tell your boss that you're refusing to do your job? Guy, I get paid $8 an hour, he said, pulling a key off the big ring he had attached to his belt. Here's the Grandmaster key. Give it back to me when you're done. I'll be upstairs in the office. Thanks a lot. He walked off, ignoring my sarcasm, leaving me alone in the dark, mildew-stinking basement. I turned on my flashlight and began to venture down the ancient corridor. Pushing my way past the curtains of cobwebs, I walked deeper and deeper into the darkness, the smell getting worse with each step. What was that stench, I wondered. Spiders were soon crawling on my skin and in my hair, up my sleeves and down my back. I tried to contain my terror and brush them off of me as best as I could, but there were always more. Soon I felt them biting me beneath my clothes as I invaded deeper and deeper into their territory. The spiders were so distracting that I didn't even notice at first when the rats started swarming past. Just a couple at the start, then a half dozen at a time. Soon they were moving around me in a fleshy, airy herd. The warmth of them radiated from the floor and I moved as quickly as I could through the swelling midst of them. There were hundreds, perhaps thousands of rats. I'd never seen so many in one place. The door up ahead was locked with a thick steel chain and a padlock from a century ago, but that wasn't stopping the rats. In the glow of my flashlight, I saw them moving through a hole they had made in the baseboards after chewing through it like acid. They streamed through this gap like flowing water. With shaking hands, I pulled out the key which I had tucked into my front pocket. I inserted it into the lock and turned it with effort. The lock was rusted to the point of almost being seized. After a great deal of jiggling and desperate pounding against the door with my shoulder, it creaked open. Inside was another long corridor stretching off into the darkness. Rats were squeaking and fighting amongst themselves, running around on the floor, and I saw that the security guard had been telling the truth. Some of them were the size of small cats. I just hoped they weren't hungry enough to take a bite of me. This hallway stretched mind-bendingly off into the far distance. I couldn't believe how big this place was. The old mental hospital had been built nearly 200 years prior, and it was massive. It was also rumored to be haunted, but I had more tangible things to worry about than ghosts at that moment. The rats were a constant presence as I forced myself to go deeper into the darkness. A large part of me wanted to go back, to say this was too much for me, but another part said no. This was my job, and it was up to me to get this done. I could only imagine the Yelp reviews and what they would say about an exterminator too scared of rats to exterminate them. But the smell, the smell was almost too much to bear as I trudged closer and closer to the unknown source of it. Something told me if I could find the source of that smell, 
I'd find what was causing the rat problem. I anticipated a leak leading into the municipal sewer system, but I never expected what I ended up discovering. I noticed there was a small gap in the left side of the tunnel up ahead. Rats were pouring out of this space and into the larger corridor where I was standing. I tried to push against the side of the gap and found it slid open further. It was a secret doorway. The sliding door was covered in textured paint which matched the walls around it. I pushed it open and stepped inside. Rats were nearly up to my knees at this point, many of them climbing on top of one another. I used my flashlight to bat them off of me as some tried to crawl up my legs, one getting almost to my neck. I tried to stop myself from panicking, but I could feel my heart pounding and I was beginning to wonder what the hell I'd been thinking going down there alone. The tunnel led downwards, heading deeper and deeper below ground. It appeared to be crude and dug by hand without the use of sophisticated equipment. There was no lighting and the ground was filled with potholes and ruts which I repeatedly tripped over. I imagined falling face down in the midst of all those rats and squirmed at the thought. Eventually, after several long minutes of descending deeper and deeper downwards, the space opened up before me and I saw I was in a large hidden cave system beneath the hospital. I braced myself as I followed the trail of rats and saw a cluster of them in the darkness up ahead. I went forward to examine the source of the asylum's rat problem. I couldn't help but wonder if the management of the hospital knew about this underground cave system beneath the place, or if it was a secret even to them. But one thing was for sure, somebody had made this secret tunnel leading down to this cavern. And the person using the hidden passage these days was doing so with some terrible purposes in mind. As I drew closer to the horde of rats, the terrible smell I had noticed earlier began to grow stronger, to the point of being almost unbearable. I pulled up my shirt over my face and pointed the flashlight beam towards the source of that horrible odor. There was a pit with at least a dozen dead bodies in it, each of them in varying states of decomposition. The rats were crawling over the faces of men and women, eating their skin and pulling off scraps of flesh from their necks and ears, lips and eyelids. The eyeballs were already missing from each of the bodies, as if those were the tastiest and the rats had decided to eat them first. With growing concern, I saw a few of them were wearing service uniforms. There were plumbers, electricians, carpenters, and more than one exterminator. I spun around just as the familiar security guard was sneaking up behind me with a hammer. He swung it hard at my face, but he wasn't anticipating my quick response. Dodging out of the way, I saw his eyes were full of rage, focused intently on me. He looked savage and angry as he took a swing at me with his hammer, then another and another, each time just barely missing as I ducked out of the way. He grazed me once on the shoulder though, nearly crippling me despite the fleeting impact. The kid was young and he was quick, but he was filled with anger and it was making him sloppy and careless. Each time he missed, I could see his rage growing, his face getting redder, his eyes more and more manic. And with that came a lack of focus as he fell further and further away with each strike. I realized I only had one chance to fight back since I was without a weapon. My mind formulated a plan as I circled back around towards the pit filled with dead bodies. With my back to it, I slowed down, acting tired. Then, as he came at me, I pretended to be surprised at having backed myself into a corner. He attacked, and at the very last second I dodged away, kicking him in the back as he went off balance. His eyes went wide with surprise, having missed wildly with his attack. The security guard who had lured me down there went flying into the pit of rats and dead bodies, spinning and turning in the air as he landed so that he was looking up at me. A moment later, the vermin swarmed him. It was like piranha smelling blood in the water. As soon as they saw the fresh meat, they began to feast on his flesh as he screamed. I slowly backed away, watching carefully to make sure he didn't chase after me. But within a few moments, the screams began to turn into bubbling gurgles and a wheezing death rattle. Soon after that, I heard nothing at all, and it was silent except for the sounds of rats eating the man as I retreated back the way I'd entered. The rats were swarming back towards the caverns, 
I saw with pleasant surprise as I made my way up towards the entrance of the caves. Finally back in the basement, I stood watching as the rats' numbers began to thin, their masses returning to their home in the cave system after smelling the fresh meat. After the last ones had gone back through the secret door, I closed it shut and heard it lock securely in place. The hidden tunnel was once again disguised to blend in perfectly with the basement wall, tucked away in the derelict hallway that no one ever visits anymore. Not only that, but I had solved the rat problem. Like I said before, it takes a special kind of person to be an exterminator. It's not for everyone. And some people just don't have what it takes. When I was a kid, I lived across the street from a family with a little girl. Her name was Emily, and our parents used to get us together for play dates because we were around the same age. This started when we were really young, like three or four. By the time we were eight years old, we were nearly inseparable. But then one summer, Emily came home from a family trip with a doll. When you're eight years old, you don't really know fear not unless you've experienced something terrible. And if you're lucky, terrible doesn't happen to you until much later in life. Emily and I weren't lucky. She called the doll Daisy. It was one of those with stiff arms and legs made out of plastic, attached to a soft fabric body filled with stuffing. It had a pink dress with white flowers printed on it, daisies. This was right around the time Tickle Me Elmo was a huge hit, and the makers of the doll were apparently trying to cash in on the concept. Daisy had a voice box in her head, and when Emily pressed on her chest, she would talk or giggle. <laughs> Unlike Elmo, she wouldn't vibrate or squirm, though. She had shimmery blonde hair and blue eyes over a button nose and a smiling mouth. Daisy looked like a normal doll, but for some reason, she creeped me out from the first time I saw her. And not a day after she brought the doll home, strange things started happening at Emily's house. I remember knocking on the door that day to see if Emily could play. I know you wrote it. Emily's mother shouted inside the house. How could you say those things to me? I didn't write anything. Her father shouted. I don't know where that note came from. Her mother answered the door, tears streaming down her face. She barely looked at me before turning away and shouting up the stairs for Emily. When my friend came out, she looked sullen. She stepped out the front door and then stopped as if someone had called her name. But all I could hear was her mother crying inside. I'll be right back, Emily said. She went inside and came back out with Daisy a minute later. The doll sat nearby as we played in her front yard. Emily kept glancing at it, but they weren't happy glances. It was like she was suspicious of the thing. A couple of days later, I was shooting hoops in my driveway when I heard shouting from Emily's house. Her father burst out onto the porch with the doll in his hand tossing it into the front yard before going back into the house. I watched the doll for a long time before I went back to shooting hoops. And when I glanced back over at the yard, it was gone. A couple of minutes later, I heard Emily's father yelling about the doll. I don't want that thing in my house. He shouted. What did I tell you? I didn't do it. Emily screamed. I hate it. Later that night, I heard screaming and glass breaking from across the street. It was late and I was supposed to be in bed, but I went downstairs and found my mom and dad on the phone with 911 while they paced in the living room and looked out the window. I moved up between them and peered out the window, looking at my friend's house. The front door came open and Emily ran out, tripping and falling down the porch steps. I ran to my door and outside, quickly looking both ways before I crossed the street. Both my parents were shouting as they ran after me. Emily was in pink pajamas that were stained crimson with fresh blood. It was on her face and in her hair. She was bawling as she ran up to my mom, who picked her up and hugged her. My dad had a strange look on his face that I didn't realize until later was fear. I'd never seen my dad terrified before, but he was that night as he moved up to the porch and peered through the door Emily had left open. I moved up behind him unable to stop myself and not knowing just how bad things were inside the house. Before I could get much more than a glimpse of Emily's parents, my dad realized I was behind him. He turned around and scooped me up, getting me away from the bloody sight of the two hacked up bodies in the house. 
I just remember thinking that every knife in the house must have been sticking out of Emily's parents. We went across the street to my house while we waited for the police. My dad called 911 again and gave them the update. He stayed on the phone with them until the police got there. All the while, Emily was bawling. Most of her words I couldn't make out, but there was one that rang as clear as a church bell inside my head. Daisy. It was an accusatory cry, as if she was trying to convince us, and herself, that Daisy, the doll, had killed her parents. It took several hours for the police to sort everything out, as much as they could, anyway. They searched the neighborhood for the killer, but never found anyone. I overheard one of the police officers and a child services person talking to Emily in our kitchen after they got her cleaned up and calmed down. Emily kept saying that her doll did it, that she saw the doll do it. She described Daisy to them over and over. But the cops said there was no doll in the house matching that description. When I heard that, I went around the house and made sure every door and window was locked. I was the only one who believed Emily, but no one listens to kids about this kind of stuff. My parents offered to keep Emily until the social services people figured out what to do with her, but they said it was against the law. So we all went outside. It must have been one in the morning by that time to see Emily off. She gave me a hug before she got into the back of the car. I watched as the car started up and pulled away from the curb in front of my house. And as it moved off down the street, I heard Emily scream, even though all the windows were up. Then I saw a familiar face pop up in the back window. Daisy the doll's face. It was dusk when I decided to use the internet cafe. The sun was low and the buildings of Tokyo were illuminated in shades of a rich, blood-like red. I only needed about 10 minutes. I only had one document to print. I suppose it could have waited until the next morning, but for my own peace of mind, I just wanted it done. I entered that particular lonely cafe right at the day's end. I was tired, stressed, and just wanted to go to bed, but duty called. I removed my glasses and rubbed away a smudge on the right-hand lens, nodding politely to the man behind the desk towards the back of the room. I slid my glasses back up my nose as I slumped down into a chair, squinting at the screen before me and dropping my briefcase by my feet. Thudded a tall, softly glowing server tower at the side of the room. I glanced over at it. I wasn't sure what a lone server would be doing in the main computer room. I thought at first that it might just be an unusual decoration, a centerpiece, but no. The flashing red lights and the wires connecting the tower to the ceiling implied that it was in use. Whatever, I don't know much about computers. I'm sure it had a good reason for being there. It thudded again loudly, whirring and grinding. I glanced at my neighbor, well, relative neighbor at least. A man hunched over his computer at the end of my row, several desks away. He paid the server tower no mind, and so I chose to do the same. I returned to my screen, navigating to the browser and then to my email, tapping away at the keys. The email site tried to buffer and then failed. I tried it a second time, but again, it failed to load. Irritated, I attempted the site for a third time and the screen simply froze on the buffering icon, a maddening red circle, slowly spinning around and around, around and around. With a sigh, I opened another browser and tried again. I saw an interesting article pop up as I did so and found myself intrigued. Shooting a look down to the clock in the lower right corner of the screen, I decided I had a few minutes to spare so I opened the article and began to read, passing the time and quickly losing myself to the interesting words. I clicked from this article to the next, adjusting my collar and clearing my throat as the temperature began to rise. I returned to the email site and tried again. It loaded at last, though I was met with another frustrating buffer when I searched for the email in question, the one with all my documents. Hey, no matter, I just jumped back to the articles reading and reading. And it's funny, at the time they were so fascinating, so engrossing. But right now, 
I couldn't tell you what a single one was even about. I don't remember a damn word. I felt myself beginning to sweat. I wiped a thin layer from my forehead and rubbed my palm against my pants before placing it back onto the mouse. Not particularly sanitary, but hey, perhaps the owner could consider investing in some air conditioning. The server tower over to my left glistened in the dim red light. Had it always been so gloomy in here? I looked over to it. It appeared slick and shiny too, just like myself. Then again, perhaps it was just a trick of the light. I tried the email again, inching closer and closer to my goal, splitting my attention between the site in question and the pages upon pages of tantalizing, curious content. Content that now eludes me, but I remember the feeling the feeling of delving deeper and deeper, of learning, of discovering truths, truths long hidden away. I felt something stick to one of my fingers as I typed, still searching my glitching inbox for the documents. I didn't even look down at the keyboard. I just tried to flick the stickiness away before continuing. There it was again, something sticky connecting to my forefinger to one of the keys. I glanced down to see a smear of some unknown, disgusting liquid and in revulsion, I wiped it on a tissue in my pocket. This is revolting, I thought to myself, sweat beginning to leak from my back and into my shirt. I just need these things printed, and then I'm out of here. This is insane. My glasses were beginning to fog. I removed them to wipe down the lenses. My throat was also deathly dry. I don't quite know why it took me so long to realize, but it was at this moment that I became aware of just how wrong my surrounding atmosphere really was. The last time I removed my glasses, the light in the room wasn't quite so red. The shadows weren't quite so deep. And that humming, that background beat, that pounding, it wasn't quite so regular. Screw this, I thought to myself. I tore my attention away from the computer's tempting, crypting passages and articles. I tried the email site just one more time and searched for the docs, but the screen froze. Pixels appeared and disappeared at random. I looked down to the lower right-hand corner. I tried to lift my wrist and look at my watch, and by doing so, I realized two things in very quick succession. First, the timer on the computer was incorrect. Far more time had passed in actuality than the built-in computer's clock would suggest. And second, my hands were now connected to the keyboard. I considered this development with outright dismay. Long, red, wet strands of an unknown mucus connected my fingertips to the keys. The letters oozed and bulged with a thick, reddish gunk, leaking out disturbingly from beneath the keys and across the keyboard. Ah! I cried out in alarm, panicking, trying to stand up, to pull myself free from the computer. But I found myself unable to do so. The same gunk across my hands had seeped to the chair and into my clothes, binding me to the seat. Uh, hey! I called out to my neighbor, the man at the end of the row. What's happening? But the man did not respond. Hey, please! I called out to him, but the man sat motionless. I raised my hands with the keyboard attached and slammed them down in frustration. The man across from me tipped forwards ever so slightly. As he began to droop, his head turned to mine, and to my horror, I saw that he was entirely faceless. The man was a fake, a dummy, dressed up in a suit and a wig. I stared at the dummy in a panic, and after a moment, he simply slumped to the floor, taking his chair with him, which was attached by a fleshy, reddish goo. I turned to the man behind the desk, the man who'd been standing in the shadow since the beginning. I looked at him, I really looked at him, and it became apparent that he too was a fake, a faceless, soulless dummy. I tried to spin around to look at the others in this humid, darkening room. The walls were damp, streaked with moisture. Wildly, I turned this way and that, staring at the others in the building. But all of them, all of them were fakes. I'd been sitting here this whole time with a group of non-entities. And that beating, that rhythmic pounding. My eyes fell upon the tower server, the lone server, right there against the slick, sticky wall a black beacon with thin, red beams glowing from the inside. With a sudden shout and a rush of force, I tore my hands from the keyboard and staggered up and out of the chair. 
It disconnected from my back with a wet pop. I still had one problem. My legs were still attached to the lower half of the chair. With all the strength I had left, I pushed the chair from my legs, losing much of the fabric of my clothes in the process. What the hell is this place? What is happening? I shouted out into the gloom, but I was answered with nothing but that pounding of the server and a rumbling from the walls. I marched over to the server with wet footsteps. I had to know. I just had to know. And so with trembling hands, I reached up for a panel, hooked my fingers through the gap, and I tore it from the body of the tower. It fell from my grip, clattering off a nearby desk and landing with a sick wet slap against the ground. And behind the panel, illuminated in that soft, pulsating red, was nothing but leaking flesh. Intricate red tendrils coiled and throbbing, black red ooze leaking down the plastic and the metal. And in the very center was a beating heart, bloated and blackened and overgrown, pounding and beating in its repetitive rhythm. I recoiled in terror, struggling to contain the contents of my stomach as I felt bile rise up and into my throat. I spun around on the spot, reaching down and grabbing my briefcase as I made my escape, hauling it from the floor with a grunt of effort, watching as spurts of blood and thick, dark, fleshy tendrils were snapped in the process. I could feel myself sinking deeper and deeper into the floor with every step. I reached out for the front door, painfully aware of the walls that were now hungrily closing in. The ever-present, growing rumble, and the fevered beating of the twisted heart sounded louder than ever. No! I screamed. Please! Using the last of my strength, I body slammed through the door, tumbling chaotically out and into the street, collapsing to my side. A man on a bike had to swerve to avoid me, and he swore as I landed with a painful thud. I groaned and shot a look back to the cafe, but there was nothing out of the ordinary to see. A closed sign hung on the front door. The window was pitch black and all the lights were off. No red, no moisture, just dark and empty. I awkwardly clambered to my feet. My clothes were ruined and my hands. My hands were stained with that thick red viscous fluid. I could hold it no longer. I vomited violently onto the sidewalk before turning and running, swearing never, ever to return. Passing through the cemetery allowed me to get home about five minutes faster. The bus stop was just a block over and the cemetery took up an entire block to itself. So instead of walking down and around it to my house, I'd gotten into the habit of cutting through. Granted, every other time I'd passed through, it was early evening. Tonight, it was a few minutes until midnight. So when I started hearing strange noises from one of the mausoleums, I first attributed it to the late hour and my overworked mind. I had worked a double at the restaurant after one of the other servers called in sick at the last minute. Now I smelled like Tex-Mex, sweat, and grease as I paused and looked toward the distant mausoleum. It was one I had passed many times, but I'd never heard anything like this before. The sound was a low murmur of voices, as if a group of people were praying inside the stone building. It was one of the larger buildings on the grounds, so I figured it was meant for an entire family. It looked like a miniature Roman temple with white columns flanking the entrance and a peaked roof with the family name carved under it. As with all the other mausoleums and graves I passed, I often wondered who the people inside had been in life. The name was Blackburn. I imagined they were high society members from the early 1900s. I pictured the men in the family wearing suits and fedoras, the women dressing like flappers with high heels and sparkly dresses. I heard something move in the darkness behind me. I glanced in that direction, seeing nothing but gravestones. It was probably a cat or a rabbit. The noise had broken my trance, and I continued on my way, keeping to the path I always took through the graveyard. It would bring me within a few yards of the Blackburn Mausoleum. I didn't think much of it. If people wanted to come and pray for their loved ones in the middle of the night, who was I to judge? But as I approached the structure, I slowed involuntarily. 
almost not even realizing I was doing it. A relaxing feeling came over me, almost like the feeling you get when listening to good ASMR. The skin on the back of my head and neck buzzed comfortably, and my eyelids drooped halfway down. Something about that murmuring was so nice. I turned toward the Blackburn mausoleum, my legs moving again. I noticed with a smile that the door was cracked, revealing a shaft of pale light coming from inside. The murmuring grew in intensity, and it sounded like the people talking were saying my name. Although it wasn't really my name, the sounds didn't match. But I had the unmistakable feeling that they were talking to me. I reached out and grabbed the door, pushing it open, peering inside. A man and a woman were kneeling on the stone floor of the mausoleum, with their backs to me. I could tell that they were older because they both had wavy white hair cascading down the backs of their necks. The woman's hair was longer than the man's, but even his was long enough to cover his collar. The woman wore a tasteful white gown, and the man wore a suit. I couldn't see their faces, or any part of them not covered by clothing, but they were both rocking back and forth, and I could tell that the pleasant murmuring was coming from them. Some small part of me said that there were too many voices in the murmurs for just two people, but I couldn't worry about such silly things. Not when I knew these two nice old people needed my help. As I stepped into the Blackburn mausoleum, both of them stopped their rocking, although the murmuring continued. I'm here, I said, smiling. There was a crunching, creaking sound as the man nodded. He stood up, still with his back to me. He was about four inches shorter than me. His thin, bony shoulders made it look as if his suit jacket were hanging on a clothes hanger. He turned toward me, revealing a rotting, skeletal face with a permanent, lipless grin. His eyes were nothing but shriveled orbs held tentatively in place by cracking eyelids. That small part of me that knew something was wrong suddenly screamed out, breaking me out of my trance. My heavy eyelids snapped open as I inhaled a sharp breath. I stepped back just as the man reached a skeletal hand out and grabbed my wrist. The immensity of the sudden pain made me cry out and look down at my wrist. The dried, nearly gone skin of the man's hand was growing back before my very eyes. Muscles and veins appeared on his fingers in the back of his hand, while my own hand and wrist withered in a matter of moments. Panic-stricken, I grabbed his forearm with my free hand. The transformation apparently hadn't reached so far up his arm, because the brittle bones inside the suit sleeve crunched under my grip. A dry scream erupted from somewhere in the man as he reached for my neck. I felt his scratchy fingers scrape across the soft skin of my neck, the touch tightening my skin as he tried to steal my life. I flinched back, yanking on his arm as I went. The bones inside his suit sleeve separated, and I stumbled out of the building. His right hand was still fastened to my arm, but now that it was severed from him, the sickening effect seemed to have mostly reversed itself. Turning to run, I pulled the hand off with some effort, tossing it to the ground. As I ran, I glanced back over my shoulder to see his figure backlit in the mausoleum doorway. I ran all the way back to my house, fear like I'd never known following me the whole way. Although I made it out with my life, I still have the marks to show from that night. The skin of my left wrist is discolored and wrinkled, and my hand is noticeably weaker than it was before. And on my neck, three narrow, discolored marks remind me of where the fingers of his other hand touched me for no more than a moment. Needless to say, I no longer cut through the cemetery on my way home, not at any time of day. I was eating breakfast in the little kitchen of my college house when I heard the voices coming from the basement again. It was strange because that part of the house was unoccupied and yet I'd heard the voices coming from down there time and time again. Each time it was a man and a woman, their bickering carrying through the vents to my ears. My friend Ted was living with me at the time, going to school for music theory. He came downstairs just at that moment to eat a bowl of cereal. I put my finger to my lips and pointed down as he entered the room. Are that right? I whispered. He raised his eyebrows and listened the voices continued arguing bitterly. Who the hell is that? 
It had happened a few days prior as well. We had only recently moved into the house and the landlord was a bit eccentric, but he'd assured us that we were alone when we asked him about it. I heard the front door open suddenly. Hello, guys. Our landlord shouted in his deeply accented voice as he entered, unannounced, just as I was thinking of him. The man consistently barged into the house without knocking, despite tenant rights laws which prohibited such things. He also liked to hook up the adjacent houses, which he also owned, with ethernet cables running out through the back door, thus providing cheap and painfully slow internet access for us and the entire neighborhood. A couple days prior, Ted and I had begun to call the landlord Dragon, mostly due to his Machiavellian nature and because he told us he lived on a street called Stone Ridge. Also, his last name was Dragovic or something similar. We didn't dare call him Dragon to his face, though. Although, in retrospect, he probably would have taken it as a compliment. Hey, I said as he entered the kitchen. Could you give us a call next time you want to come over? Even just knocking would be a big improvement. You guys are so funny, he said, sitting down and pouring himself a bowl of cereal. Wild college party guys, I love it. So, what are we doing today? Playing a prank on the Dean like in the movies? Ted and I looked at each other awkwardly, unsure how to get him to leave and understand this was not okay. He couldn't just come in uninvited and eat our cinnamon toast crunch. But at the same time, there was the matter of the basement. Actually, we're mostly just doing homework today. Very busy with homework. But we were wondering about the basement. We heard voices from down there, just now. A man and a woman talking. Dragon poured some milk in his bowl and ate a large bite, speaking with his mouth full. There's nobody in the basement, guys. We've been over this. You want me to show you? Come, I'll show you. We'll go see the basement together. He led us down the stairs into the basement with the bowl in his hand, sloshing milk everywhere, and showed us the small apartment down there. To his credit, it was completely empty. See, no voices to make talk talk. You boys are hearing things. And there's no other rooms down here? I asked. None. Like I say, you imagine this. These old houses, they make weird sounds sometimes. He led us back upstairs and sat back down to finish his cereal. So, you guys liking this place so far, right? Pretty nice. You have the whole house to yourselves. It's your bachelor pad. You party it up. Just make sure you invite me, okay? And don't wreck the place. Actually, on second thought, no parties. He stood up after finishing his cereal and puttered around the kitchen for a few seconds, then blurted out, Oh, by the way, you have my rent money? It's only the 15th of the month. We don't have to pay you for another two weeks. Okay, okay. If you don't have it right now, no problem. All right, I better get going. You guys have a good one. Dragon went out the front door, and the two of us were left alone again, wondering what the hell we'd gotten ourselves into with this awful low-budget house we'd rented. Little did we know, it was about to get much, much worse. That night, I was in my bed sleeping when I woke up shivering. It was freezing cold in my bedroom, and when I opened my eyes and exhaled, I realized I could see my breath. What the hell? I considered just wrapping myself up in another blanket, but then decided against it. The thermostat had to be malfunctioning, or it was just adjusted wrong. It was dangerously cold in the house, and if I didn't do something fast, it would only get colder. Sure enough, when I got downstairs, the digital thermostat showed the temperature was 50 degrees Fahrenheit. I pressed the arrow buttons at the side and watched the temperature increase until it read 72. Then I bumped it up a couple degrees more, just for good measure. The heating vents kicked on, and I held my hand up to the one in the kitchen to warm my numb fingers. I went back up the stairs to my bedroom and laid down, closing my eyes and drifting back to sleep. But an hour later, I woke up shivering again, my breath a frosty plume each time I exhaled. This time I stomped down the stairs and over to the thermostat, where I saw it read 45 degrees. I couldn't understand why it would be doing this, 
so I looked at the settings on the thermostat and played with it, trying to figure out what was causing the issue. Everything looked normal, and this hadn't happened on previous nights. It didn't make any sense. So I decided to go down to the basement to take a look at the furnace for myself. I opened the door leading down the stairs and began to walk slowly down the steps to the lower level of the house. It was dark and silent. I tried to turn on a light, but none of them seemed to work. Once I got down to the basement, I realized it was much warmer down there. It was actually very hot. I was quickly sweating as I made my way over to the furnace. Something was definitely wrong with the heating in the house, since it was freezing on the second floor, but it was an oven down in the basement. But that didn't explain why the thermostat kept changing on its own. The furnace offered no clues, mostly since I had no idea what I was looking for. Everything seemed to be in good working order, at least as far as I could tell in the dim light. The big steel beast rumbled and groaned to life suddenly, startling me as it kicked in to meet the demands of the thermostat upstairs. Hot air began to fill the room and I started to sweat even more. Giving up on trying to fix it, I went for the exit instead. Just as I reached the door, it slammed shut in my face. I felt as if I was going to have a panic attack as I stumbled backwards. For a moment, I was too terrified to try and open it again, but the temperature was rising quickly in the furnace room and I needed to get out fast. Hello? I called out softly, but no one answered. Pulling on the door handle, I found it wouldn't open. I threw my shoulder against it, but the thing wouldn't budge. Looking around the room, I saw a small window set high in the wall. I moved a nearby milk crate to stand on it and slid the window open. It would only open a few inches. The child's safety lock was stuck, so I couldn't get it to go any wider. There was no chance of squeezing my bulk through that crack, I thought. But at least the open window was allowing a breeze to waft in, cooling my sweat dampened face as I stood pacing, trying to figure out a plan. The room was small and devoid of any useful items. The more I looked, the hotter it started to feel in there, the small window making little difference. I felt like some terrible dog trapped in a parked car on a hot summer day, sniffing at that small gap of freedom and fresh air offered by a narrowly opened window, panting as my oxygen ran out. I was beginning to look at the furnace again, trying desperately to find a way to turn the temperature down when I heard the voices again this time more distinctly. Okay, gentlemen, this is a young one. You've seen her pictures. Need I say more? We'll start the bidding at 10,000. A soft whimpering sound came as well, and I realized there was a tiny crack of light in the wall to the left of the furnace. Looking through the gap, couldn't see much. I needed to get closer. Pushing against the panel, it began to slide forward. It appeared there was a secret room beside this one. That was where the voices had been coming from all along. The secret door revealed a winding staircase leading down. I followed it, taking my steps slowly and carefully, being as quiet as I could. As I drew closer to the hidden area of the basement, the voice became louder and could be heard more clearly. I hear 20, do we have 25? 25, I see your 25, do we have 30? Ah, very good, sir, you won't regret that. The gentleman has made it 40,000. Do we have 45? Good, 45, do we have 50? The auctioneer's voice was practiced, and I could tell he had done this many times before. He was focused so intently on the screen that he didn't even see me sneaking up on him with a hammer in my hand. It was the first item I'd seen on a desk upon entering the room. 50,000, that's the highest bid of the night. Very good, sir. We'll have her sent over immediately. His voice cut out as a wet, bone-crunching sound echoed throughout the room. Panting, I dropped the bloody hammer to the floor where it landed with a loud clomp. The young woman was blindfolded and whimpering beside me. A camera mounted on a tripod was pointed at her, surrounded by stage lights. Her wrists were bound with duct tape and her skin was red and irritated around that area. I untied her and took the blindfold off. You're safe, I said. I'm gonna get you out of here. Thank you, the girl said in broken English, the look of gratitude on her face unmistakable. On the enormous computer screens, a dozen different windows containing shadowed faces suddenly began closing one by one. 
The visages rapidly disappearing before I could register who they were, but a few did look vaguely familiar. Oligarchs and rich people I had seen on TV or in magazines, perhaps. It was impossible to be certain from such a brief glimpse. As I grabbed the girl's hand to take her out of the basement, another pair of voices came from ahead. This time, there was no way out. We were trapped. You have to do something about this heat, a woman's voice was saying. I'll show you what I mean. Raymond is getting older. He can't be working in these conditions. Did you adjust the thermostat? I did, but one of your tenants kept changing it back. We're right beneath the furnace, Dragovic. If they turn the heat up by one degree, we get blasted with hot air. It's impossible to work down here since you monkeyed with the HVAC system the other day. I'll have a chat with the tenants, our landlord answered. We'll lock out the thermostat too. That way they can't play with it. Wait, what's this? Did you leave this open? The two voices paused, and then a rustling sound of movement came hurrying towards us. I backed away, holding the girl's hand tightly. She squeezed mine back as Dragon entered the room with a woman I didn't recognize. I did, however, recognize her voice. It was the same one I had heard coming through the vent from upstairs. Speaking of the devil, Dragon said, his tone darker and angrier than I'd ever heard it before. He produced a pistol from his waist at the back. I see you've been poking around where you shouldn't have been looking. He turned to look at the woman he was with. Get on the phone with the clients. Tell them everything is secure. She nodded and went over to a nearby landline. The phone was red and old, like the one on the president's desk. And let them know we have another item up for sale on the auction block, Dragon said. A young man, tall, with broad shoulders. He'll be a great worker. We'll start the bidding at 20,000. Darkness is just setting on the landscape as I drive up a winding road to deliver a bunch of Thai food to someone in a nice neighborhood. I have the two front windows down, enjoying the cool night air. I've delivered up here many times before, so I know the area pretty well. A lot of the houses are propped on the hillside overlooking the city below. Most of them are worth well over a million dollars, which is why the two people walking down the road catch my attention. Not only are the roads dangerous to walk on because of all the turns, but there's no sidewalk either. And I've never seen anyone on foot in this neighborhood. Not unless it's someone checking the mail or bringing their trash barrel up the driveway. My GPS tells me that the house is just on the left, so I slow down and swing in. The people, a man and a woman, if I'm seeing right, are heading down the road toward me, walking along the edge of a wooded area between houses. I glance at them but don't think much else of it as I bring the several bags of food up to the house. The lady answers the door and takes the stuff, smiling politely. I smile back, telepathically telling her that she should give me a fat tip. The whole thing takes about a minute, with that done, I head back to my car, glancing around for the man and woman. I don't see them. It's dark and my back windows are tinted, so I don't notice anything wrong until I sit in the driver's seat and see a pair of crazed eyes staring at me in the rear view mirror. I start to spin around in my seat to verify that I'm not seeing things. But before I can get all the way around, the man says, turn around and face front. He sounds raspy and weak, like he's on his last legs but I do what he says because he also sounds a little nuts. And as soon as I look into the rear view mirror again, I'm glad I listened to him because he's holding a big hunting knife up for me to see. Shifting my head, I also see that the woman is in the back seat as well. Our eyes meet. She looks petrified. I can see her shaking in the mirror and I can also see that she's young. She's still in her teens. The man leans forward and I feel the blade press against my neck directly under my right ear. Drive, he says. I'm afraid talking will cause him to cut me, whether intentionally or not, so I don't speak. Instead, I start the car and reverse out of the driveway. We start down the winding road. I drive slowly, afraid a bump will open my neck up. After a moment, the guy says, drive normal. I swallow and get up to the posted speed limit. As we're getting to the bottom of the mountain, I finally risk a question. 
Where do you want me to take you? He's thinking about this as we approach an intersection with a red light. Turn left, he says. I get into the left turn lane and look at him in the mirror. Then I see something that makes my eyes bulge. There's a cop car coming up behind us. The guy sees my eyes go wide and turns to look over his shoulder, nicking me with a knife as he does it. I wince, feeling the blood welling up and dripping slowly down my neck. Just be f***ing cool, the guy says, taking the knife away from my neck and putting it up to the girls. She yelps in fear. I'll slit her throat if you do anything stupid. Then I'll jam this blade into your ear. I'm fast enough to do it. I nod once, still watching the cop. It's soon clear that the cruiser isn't going to turn left, but that means it's going to stay in the right lane, which means it will stop directly beside us. The guy in the back seems to realize this at the same time I do. Roll up your window, he says. The right window. He's thinking about the blood on my neck. If the cop sees it, But it's too late now, anyway. The cruiser is pulling up next to us. It'll draw their attention if I do it now, I say. Just don't f***ing move, he whispers. I stare dead ahead, trying to see if the cop is looking this way, using only my peripheral vision. Don't you do it, big, the guy says in back. Don't you f***ing do it. I can feel the blood sliding down toward my shirt collar. I wonder if it's noticeable in the backsplash from my dashboard. The smell in the car is that of fear, sweat, and fresh urine. I think the girl has let her bladder go. I don't blame her. I see movement out of the corner of my eye, but stay perfectly still. Then the cop speaks. Hey, you're bleeding, he says. Unsure what else to do, I turn my head to tell him some bullshit story and how I cut myself. But as I do, I hear the sound of a sharp blade slicing through me. The girl's blood splashes against my face as the guy opens her throat. Knowing he aims to make good on his threat, I throw myself against the steering wheel just as he moves the blade toward me. I feel the tip of it slice through my shirt and into my back, opening me up. As he pulls it back again to get ready for another slice, I reach down with my left hand and gank on the seat back release lever, throwing myself into the seat back and sending it flying toward him. The blade sinks into the seat back from the other side as it comes down, but then the hilt is pressed against his leg, making it impossible for him to get it out again. The girl flails beside him, one hand to her wound while the other reaches for the man's face. I realize she's trying to claw his eyes out. I throw my car in park and then open the door, launching myself out and landing halfway in the oncoming traffic lane. A car comes to a screeching halt, about a foot from running me over. Inside the car, the man screams. The sound of a gunshot gets me to my feet again. I look over my car to see the cop standing at my passenger side window, his gun pointed into the vehicle at an angle. I lean down and look inside, seeing the two dead people in my back seat, one of them killed by a bullet, the other by a knife wound. It doesn't take the cops long to find out that it was a kidnapping gone wrong. The girl was some guy's rich daughter. The kidnapper was some strung out addict whose car wouldn't start after he broke into the girl's house and forced her out at knife point. Me? I was just a delivery driver in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now I'm a delivery driver with over 40 stitches in his back and a massive car cleaning bill. When you're young, death seems almost impossible. You laugh in its face because that's the only thing you know how to do. It's the only way the young can deal with the inevitable truth we all must face. The truth that, one day, will be nothing but a memory. This tendency was what brought me and my friends to the old graveyard on the outskirts of our small Vermont town one crisp fall evening. It was boredom mixed with that indefinable urge to prove to each other that we didn't fear death. It was the sure knowledge that we would find nothing but silent gravestones and scattered leaves on the hallowed ground. But I knew my friends well enough to know that we were all looking forward to creeping each other out just a little bit to pass the time. Jason, Samantha, and I got out of the car outside the main entrance to the graveyard. There was an old wooden church there, which was still in use by a dozen or so old timers who lived outside of town. But as far as I knew, The graveyard was no longer accepting new dead. The old black wrought iron fence surrounding the considerable lot 
had probably been there for over 100 years. We moved through the archway, joking and giggling like the teenagers we were. Clouds slowly passed the sliver of moon in the sky, providing little light for us to see by. This was in the time before cell phones, so we had no convenient way to light our path. None of us had thought to bring a flashlight. Indeed, it would have spoiled the fun. So we had to wait as our eyes adjusted to the dim surroundings. As we crested a rolling hill among the tilted and fading gravestones, I heard a distant giggle, as if from a child. I turned toward Jason, our resident prankster, and asked, How did you do that? He smiled but shook his head. What? That giggle. I heard it too, Samantha said in a spooky voice. I don't think it was Jason. It was probably the protectors of the dead. I scrunched my face up. Protectors of the dead? Is it ghost story time now? You haven't heard the stories about this graveyard? Samantha asked, wide-eyed. I thought that was the whole reason for coming here. You're kidding, right? I asked. You know what she's talking about, Jason? My friend nodded. Oh, sure. You gotta be careful out here. Don't disturb anything, like this. Jason moved to the nearest gravestone and kicked it with the flat of his foot. The thing tilted slightly, the ground around its base bulging. Don't do that, Samantha said. I'm serious, they're real. My grandma told me so. Just a bunch of old person nonsense, Jason said. If you believe that stuff, you're... A dark shape dotted toward us before disappearing behind a gravestone. I pointed. What the hell was that? Just a cat or something, Jason said, ever the macho man. That'd be the biggest cat I've ever seen, I said. Maybe we should go. Without a word, Jason stalked forward toward the gravestone behind which the dark shape had disappeared. He moved fast, looking behind it. Nothing here. He smiled and sat on top of the gravestone, crossing his arms, looking smug. With his weight on the old stone, it tilted, the grass at its base bulging, much like the other one had. Only this time, it wasn't just the gravestone that was moving the ground. A hand-shaped smudge of darkness burst from the ground and grabbed Jason by the ankle. Although it looked like a constantly shifting formation of black smoke, it was clearly real enough to touch him. Jason shouted and stood up to run, but the hand held fast. Help me! He screamed. Dark, child-sized figures appeared all around us, rushing forward with glowing yellow eyes and hungry mouths with bright white teeth. They converged on Jason, who was now screaming in pain. Some of them grabbed hold of his arms and legs, while others plunged their shimmering dark hands into his chest and his head, as if his skin and bone were no more a barrier than the chilly night air. I moved forward to help my friend, but Samantha grabbed my arm. I looked back at her, and she shook her head, wide, frightened eyes pleading with me. Yanking my arm from her grasp, I moved toward my screaming friend and went to grab one of the strange, childlike creatures. As soon as my fingers touched the smoky skin, a shotgun blast of visions hit me. I experienced the death of every single person buried in that graveyard as if it were my own. I found myself screaming in pain on a Civil War battlefield as a surgeon sawed my leg off just before darkness took me. I was an old woman, alone in my house, when a tremendous pain gripped me by the chest. My breathing suddenly stopped as I fell to the floor, gripped by panic for the final moments of my life. I was shot, stabbed, and trampled by horses. I died on a battlefield somewhere in Europe when poison gas rolled toward the American trench and I couldn't find my gas mask. I took my own life half a dozen times, and I died in my sleep a dozen more. I was riddled with disease and consumed by cancer. And once, as a black man, I was hung from a tree by a mob of white people for some imagined insult. And I could do nothing to stop any of it. Nothing at all. Just as I knew I could do nothing to stop my own eventual demise. The only deaths I did not experience were those of the children buried in the graveyard. Because their spirits were otherwise occupied. They were the protectors of the dead. Gasping for air, I found myself on the ground in the graveyard. Samantha was trying to pull me up to get me away from the furious assault still happening to Jason mere feet away. Scrambling up, I ran away with Samantha, only slowing to vomit along the way. Samantha drove to her grandmother's house, 
waking the old woman up and telling her what had happened. Take me there at once, the woman said, still in her nightgown. I was there for all this, but I was still reliving all those deaths I had experienced, the swirl of emotions inside overwhelming my adolescent mind. When we returned to the graveyard, Samantha and her grandmother found Jason wandering among the gravestones with a blank look on his face. Jason never was the same after that. The doctors couldn't figure out what had happened, and Samantha's grandmother told us not to tell what we'd seen. She said we'd be social outcasts if we told the truth. So we did as she said. Jason eventually came around after many years. He was able to get a job and support himself, but he always had that blank look in his eyes and he barely said a word to anyone unless he had to. If I experienced what I did from only touching one of those things, I can't imagine what Jason went through. As for me, I still dream about all those deaths I experienced. But for all the fear and terror and dread, I think it's made me a better man. Because I know there's no stopping death. I've seen what it's like. I felt its icy grip on my heart. But a funny thing happened many years after that night. I realized I was no longer afraid of death. I accepted it. I respected it and it freed me to live the life that very few people get to live. A life of constant gratitude and awe. A life I know will most likely come to an unpleasant end, and that's okay. I can't do this no more, the man shouted. I heard him clearly through the closed office door as I sat in the waiting area outside. The woman who answered wasn't loud enough for me to hear her words. She spoke in low, soothing tones. I can't. You'll finish out your shift, or I will deny your unemployment, the woman shouted. There was the clatter of a chair, and then the door flew open. A man with flaky skin on his face and arms stormed out, moving past me without a glance. His haunted eyes seemed lost in their own turmoil. He moved down the hall and around the corner, out of my vision. A moment later, a plump, and pleasant looking woman appeared in the office doorway and smiled at me. Sorry about that, Mr. Harris. I'm afraid our current maintenance worker is having a bit of trouble. Please, come in. It's no problem, I said, grabbing the folder with all my personal information in it. I spent the next two hours filling out paperwork and letting Mrs. Cooper copy my license and social security card and all the other legally required stuff for employment. By the time we stepped outside, the sun was beyond the western horizon, leaving only dying light to illuminate the sprawling graveyard. Mrs. Cooper radioed the maintenance man I'd seen storming out of the office. She said his name was Barnes. She wanted him to show me around before he left. But after three tries to alert him over the radio, she threw her hands up. Maybe he actually left already, she said. If you don't mind me asking, What's wrong with him? Mrs. Cooper flapped a hand. Oh, he says he's been having nightmares about dead people. He's only been working here for two years, but for the last few months, he's been struggling. I'm sure you saw his skin. Well, that's new too. Apparently, his doctor says it's stress-related. I guess some people just aren't cut out for this kind of work. I nodded, feeling sorry for the guy. But you've been in this business for a while now, right? Mrs. Cooper asked. Four years? I nodded. That's right. Good. So if I leave you to look around, you shouldn't have too much trouble getting the lay of the land, right? I have some paperwork I need to do before I call it a day. I think I'll manage, I said. Great. Mrs. Cooper produced the key ring from her pocket and handed it to me. If you walk that way, You'll see the maintenance building just over that hill. You can get in the truck and drive around if you like. Sounds good, I said, taking the keys. We parted ways, Mrs. Cooper going back inside and me heading the way she pointed. As I walked along, I saw a backhoe parked next to a couple of dug up graves. Dirt was piled haphazardly on another grave. This wasn't the way things were supposed to be done. The dirt was supposed to be put into a truck and moved out of sight 
until the ceremony was over. But as I got closer, I realized the dates on both the dug up graves were from years past. I approached warily, looking into the first grave. The casket was open at the bottom of the hole, but there was no body in it. Swallowing, I moved to the next grave and saw the same thing. Telling myself there was some logical explanation, I resumed my journey toward the maintenance building. I saw the building just like she said, but the garage door was open and there was no truck parked inside. As I got closer, I saw something on the ground in the garage. It looked like a pile of skin flakes mixed with a small amount of blood. Glancing around, I looked for any sign of Barnes. There was no one around. The place was as silent as any graveyard just after dusk, preternaturally silent. I moved through the maintenance building, noting the location of tools and bags of grass seeds and maintenance schedules. There was one empty slot on the tool wall. I didn't know what had been there, but I knew from the empty space it was a tool with a long handle, maybe an ax or a pickaxe. I stared at that empty space for a long time, a bad feeling humming through me. Finally, I headed back to the admin building to tell Mrs. Cooper I was done looking around, at least until I could find the truck. But as I came over the low hill and brought the building into view, I saw the maintenance truck parked in front of the building. Its headlights were on and the driver's door was open. From behind the vehicle, I could see that someone was sitting in the passenger seat. I wondered if it was Barnes, waiting for me to come back so he could show me the grounds. Picking up the pace, I moved up the driver's side and glanced in, freezing as I saw the decomposing corpse sitting in the passenger seat. Its dark eye sockets stared accusingly at me. Then I saw the blood on the steering wheel and the door handle. Without thinking clearly, I ran into the building and straight to Mrs. Cooper's office, coming to an abrupt stop in the doorway. Barnes was standing next to the desk, breathing heavily and holding a bloody pickaxe in his hands. The skin of his arms and face had been rubbed raw. Rivulets of blood streamed from the wounds, dripping here and there. There was blood splashed on the wall, and I could see Mrs. Cooper's feet sticking beyond the edge of the desk. The rest of her was obscured by the furniture. From the blood and the way those feet weren't moving, I had a feeling she was dead. Barnes turned toward me, his eyes fiery. He stalked over to me, pickaxe held before him. I found myself frozen with fear as the man came toward me. My legs would not move. My arms were stuck at my sides. My mind stuttered, failing me at the time when I needed it most. Barnes raised the pickaxe to strike me, and just before he swung it down, the words came out of my mouth, seemingly out of nowhere. You can go on home, I said in a voice that was impossibly calm. I'll take care of the burial. Barnes froze, pickaxe held aloft, confusion swarming his face. You're done, I said. I've got this. You don't have to do it anymore. Barnes lowered the tool, the fire in his eyes dying down to glowing embers. He stepped forward and handed me the pickaxe. Then he nodded once and walked past me. I watched him turn the corner and lost him from sight. The police later found him at home watching television. One of the officers later told me that he looked through the window and saw Barnes. The man had tears streaming down his face even before he knew the police were there. He just wanted to go away from the dead. And I guess, in the end, he did. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and smash that like button to get notified every time I upload a new video. You can also check out some more of my animated horror stories right here.